Another thing that Laplace transforms are really useful for is inverse problems. For example, trying to determine uh, the parameters for a particular physical object. So some sorts of constants that come up in a problem are easy to measure, especially things like forces. So uh, the mass of an object or the spring constant, something like that. But the coefficient of friction, it's a little more difficult. Or the diffusivity um, or maybe the elasticity properties of a particular object. Sometimes those are very tricky to find and can only be measured indirectly. So we're going to go to the um, back to the heat problem. Whoops, didn't mean to mark on that. The, the heat problem here, and we're, we're going to reinsert uh, the parameter k. And so this, this problem is all about trying to figure out what is that k. And so the Laplace transform will allow us to solve this problem uh, symbolically in terms of k. And then we can figure out um, what kind of uh, forcing function we want to apply to this thing in order to measure it. So the idea is we are, we're going to um, heat up the end of the bar according to some um, uh, f. And then we're going to measure the heat flux at some particular time. And, so, and we'll take the measurement to be a. So a is going to be, and then here's our measurement, or our expression for the heat flux. OK, so uh, like I said, it's an inverse problem. So we're sort of going backwards, as you might expect. So the first step is to go back and look at the solution uh, for the problem that we had before uh, and see how it changes when we incorporate an, a k in there because before we had uh, k equal to 1. And the first place it appears is right here in the denominator as sort of the scaling factor for the denominator. It also shows up in the denominator of the exponent right here, t minus tau. Um, and then we had our f of tau d tau, our forcing function that, that we put in there. Um, OK, and so um, since we want to um, uh, measure the, the heat flux, we're going to need to take the derivative of this guy. So let's slap a derivative with respect to x on both sides of this. And uh, so we'll move this guy under the integral sign. And we have all the same stuff again, which I will just copy and paste. Um, and now the problem is that if we use, if we do like the most straightforward natural thing and use the product rule, you, you need product rule because you've got you know uh, an x here and an x here, right? Um, so if we use the product rule to uh, evaluate that derivative and then uh, evaluate the resulting two integrals that you get from that, it turns out one of them it does not converge. It, it's it's an improper integral that does not exist. And so that's a pain. So we need to do something um, a little bit more sneaky. So what we do instead is we notice that this, this uh, thing inside the green parentheses here, that is actually the derivative of the heat kernel, mostly. It's actually minus 2k times the derivative of the heat kernel. OK. And so um, uh, now we have gxx. Integrated against f of tau, um, but the heat kernel, remember, uh, satisfies the heat equation. So, k times uh, g x x is equal to the time derivative g t, which is the uh, negative, the derivative of g with respect to tau because of that minus sign in front of the tau. So. That means that I can convert this into uh, the integral uh, g tau x. Actually, here, let me rewrite that as dd tau. There we go. Um, and now that. Uh, 
we've got this in play, I can take this guy and move him over to being a derivative on the f using integration by parts. And all I have to uh, do to pay for that is um, include a minus, a negative sign and a boundary term. So here's our gx t minus tau f of tau evaluated from uh, tau equals zero to tau equals t. And then we have minus 2k integral zero to t heat kernel times now f prime. All right, and so now um, we can choose our conditions on f so as to make this disappear. Um, and uh, then let's see, so then we're left with um, this, this other integral here. by itself. So that is, that's what we've got. Now, if we evaluate um, at, sorry, so this is now u sub x. Okay. And so if we evaluate this guy at uh, x equals zero, then um, <coughs> the exponential part of the uh, heat kernel goes away and we just have that that uh, factor out front and so now let's see so it's it's come time to choose F and it will be easy to integrate this uh, or sorry, to evaluate this integral, if if we take f to be uh, well f prime to be constant, so we'll take f to be some linear function, so that f prime is a constant, and this will also guarantee us, for example, that f of zero is equal to zero to make those boundary terms go away earlier. And actually, come to think of it. That doesn't fully justify why the boundary term goes away at uh, t equals tau. For that, you need another condition, and the author sort of glosses over it, so I'm going to gloss over it as well. Um, and so then, let's see. So um, we can now evaluate at some particular time and multiply by minus k. And so when we do that, we can rewrite this expression as, let's see, we'll pull out the square root of k and cancel the twos and, uh, from both sides. And then we have the integral of uh, beta over pi t minus tau in the square root. And <coughs> um, so on the left side, we have a as it's measured to be at time t naught, whatever value of a is. Uh, and on the right side, we can crunch the integral, and we end up with uh, square root of k times 2 beta square root of t naught over uh, root pi. And so then uh, we can solve this for k and recover our parameter, and it's pi times a squared over for beta squared t naught. And so that's how we can figure out what the diffusivity is by taking a measurement. So we just uh, increase the heat at one end of the bar steadily at rate uh, beta, um, and then um, compute it using this formula.